Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends in the present session i have come with the topic rule making power of the administration the delegated legislation in earlier session we had the discussion over the topic the doctrine of separation of powers we discussed the meaning and the concept of separation of powers the logic behind the doctrine of separation of powers, the objectives of separation of powers, the relationship between the rule of law and the separation of powers, the status of separation of powers and different three jurisdictions, UK, US and India. Then the functional and pragmatic form of doctrine of separation of powers that is the principle of checks and balances. In the present topic, we will focus on the rule making power of the administration which is known as the delegated legislation. This rule making power of administration or delegated legislation, this is the output of, this is the by product of the process of transformation from laissez faire to welfare state during the 20th century. Earlier to 20th century, particularly the 19th century was the era of laissez faire state, wherein the state had very limited functions to perform, the state had very limited jurisdiction. It was confined to perform only three kinds of functions the external security, the maintenance of law and order that is the internal security of the state and the dispersal of justice. For performing these three basic functions, the state was to collect the revenue by way of imposing the taxes. So, taxing function was also one function of the state during the regime of laissez faire era. So, we can say that during the laissez faire regime of the state, the state was performing only four functions. Number one, the external security or the security of a state from external threats or from external aggressions. Number two, the internal security or the maintenance of law and order situation of the state. And number three, the judicial functions, dispersal of justice. And finally, the imposition of the taxes and collection of revenue to perform all these three functions. That was the scope of the functions and powers of a state. And therefore, the state was not directly in the contact of the individuals. The state was in no means to interfere with the economic and social activities of the people of the state of the individuals. There was no direct interaction between the individual and the state or the government. The functions of the state were very limited, the functions of a state were very confined and therefore, the powers of a state were also very limited. That was the reason that the functions and powers of different three organs of the state that is the legislature the executive and judiciary, these were very limited in their scope and in their ambit, in their extent. There was no need of much law to produce and the legislature was very much comfortable. It was to produce very limited law for the exercise of the powers of threefold functions of the state during the regime of laissez faire state. 
that was the state of circumstances where the state had no much burden over its shoulders to produce the law. Neither there was so much technicalities or complexities in the process of making of law. So, there was no much need of the expertise, the skill or the technical knowledge for making the laws. But the advancement of the development of science and technology and different other developments during the 20th century and the process of transformation from laissez faire state to welfare state increased the functions and powers of the state tremendously and therefore, there was much need more need of the legislation to make. And therefore, we can say that the delegated legislation it is a by product of the transformation from laissez faire to welfare state. During the regime of welfare state, the state is to do everything, a state started to control the social and economic life of individuals. In earlier lecture on the introduction to administrative law, we discussed in very detail the concept of laissez faire state and the concept of welfare state. Under the regime of welfare state, the state started to make the regulations, the state started to control the economic activities, the social activities of the individuals. There was the direct interaction between the state and the individual during it is started during the regime of welfare state concept. During the welfare state concept, the state also started to do some enterprising activities. The state started to establish its own enterprises in the form of public undertaking sec public sectors, in the form of the public corporations, in the form of the public industries the state started to do economic activities itself. And therefore, the, the competition between the state undertakings, the government undertakings, the public sector and private sector started that also became a issue for the rule of law to prevail during the state of during the uh, concept of welfare state and much more legislation required to balance these competitive interest or these competitive claims of the state on one hand and the individual or private enterprises on the other hand. In public sector and private sector, there was the competition, the public sector was competing with the private sector and therefore, there was the need of balance of the fair to provide for the fair competition in public sector and the public public sector undertakings and private enterprises that was also a issue for the need of more and more laws to create such balances or to protect the rights and liberties and freedoms of the individuals the state is started to give the protection to the community or the people. So, as the protector, a state was to protect the state or the people or the community of the state from any kind of external threat. The state was also responsible to maintain the law and order situation for the better environment to provide or to provide the equal opportunities to all under the regime of rule of law, so that everybody can develop his or her personality to the fullest. That was the situation in welfare state when this concept started in 20th century. So, when the transformation from the concept of laissez faire state to welfare state took place, there was the tremendous increase in the functions of the state. The state assumed many more functions, it started to affect all the aspects of human life because of the direct interaction between the individual and the state in 
each and every activity being done by the state. That was also the point of time when it was realized that if the effective safeguards are not discovered, there would be the threat to the individual liberties, there would be the threat to the basic freedoms, there would be the threat to the fundamental rights, the basic rights of the individuals because of the increased powers of the state, because of the state in the form of organized power, where the individual became very lipid, little in front of the organized power or the power concentration of power in the institution of a state. Increased function of a state acquired more powers to assume as we can understand very easily that if the functions are increased then for the performance of these functions the more and more, more powers are required. So, side by side when the state assumed much more functions to perform the state also assumed much more powers to perform these functions. Without the exercise of powers, the increased functions could not be performed by the state and therefore, the state also assumed the powers side by side. That was also the challenge for the system to prevail, that was also the challenge for the rule of law to prevail and to limit the powers of the state, so that there may not be the threat to the individual liberties, individual freedoms, individual rights because of these increased powers of the state. This state of situation, this state of circumstances demanded more and more laws to confer the powers on the administration, so that the administration may become an effective administration, the government may become an effective government, so that an effective administration and the effective government could achieve the objectives of the welfare state, so that the effective administration and the effective government could perform all those increased functions for ensuring the welfare activities on the part of the state. This situation also gave rise to one problem and that was the problem of lack of time with the parliament. Parliament did not or the legislature did not have the sufficient time to produce such a quantity of law or such a quality of law which was required during the regime of welfare state. The legislature has many more functions other than the legislative functions other, the, other than the function to enact the laws and therefore, there was the lack. It is also one important fact that we know that the legislature does not work continuously. The legislature functions, the legislature works at certain intervals. Because of this nature of the legislative functions in the earlier lecture on separation of powers, doctrine of separation of powers, we understood why Locke designated by Locke called the legislative powers as discontinuous legislative powers because that legislative functions are not performed continuously by the legislature. So, these were the factors for the lack of time with the parliament to enact the adequate law, to enact the law in sufficient volume, in sufficient quality, in sufficient quantity which was required during the regime of welfare state. So, lack of time was one important challenge, that was one important issue, that was one important problem for the parliament. There was one more issue with the parliament during the regime of welfare state, during the advancement, during the transformation, during the new developments that the parliament did not have 
the expertise. The parliament did not have the skill, the parliament did not have the sufficient and adequate technical knowledge to handle with the situations which were newly emerging in the process of making of the law. The parliamentarians who are sitting in the parliament, they are the elected representatives and we know in the country like India and elsewhere also at many places, there is no prescription of certain qualifications or technical or technological knowledge for the persons to contest the elections, for the persons to be the members of the legislature, for the persons to be the parliamentarians. So, the parliamentarians who are engaged in making the law, who are sitting in the legislative chambers, they are not the experts of newly emerging subjects, they do not have the sufficient and adequate expertise in those matters, they do not have the technological, scientific and technical knowledge and therefore, they are not fit persons to enact the laws on such a specialized subject matters, on such complex subject matters. Different regulatory bodies, institutions to regulate different technical and technological areas were established during the regime of welfare state and there was the need for regulating those technical, technological, spatial or complex matters. But the parliamentarians because they do not have the sufficient knowledge, the expertise and the skill in those subject matters, they were not the fit persons to enact the laws, to deal with those matters or to deal with the challenges in those areas and therefore, it was realized that some assistance of the executive organ of the government, wherein the experts are there of different subject matters should be taken and by the assistance of those experts, by the assistance of those persons having the special knowledge of special complex technical technological subject matters would certainly benefit the law making process and we could evolve or we could make enact certain laws which would be self reliant, self sufficient to address different challenges, problems and issues of such kind of different areas. So, the lack of expertise with parliament to cope with the technicalities of the legislation in modern complex form of the government was also one important reason for the recognition of the rule making powers of the administration. The limitation of the lack of validity and experimentation with the ordinary legislation or ordinary legislative process was also one important issue. We also know the fact that the ordinary law making process involves formal, rigid and inflexible procedure. The procedure for making the law, the procedure for the enactment of the law, procedure to be adopted to be followed by the parliament and the state legislatures during the process of the enactment of law has already been defined, has already been explained in the constitution of the countries. So, what the, what the procedure is to be followed by the legislature, it has been prescribed in the constitution and it is the constitutional mandate for the legislature to follow that procedure. The parliament cannot make the compromises with that particular procedure given by the constitution. It is to follow that procedure as such it is a constitutional mandate, it is a constitutional obligation over the parliament to follow the same procedure 
in enacting the laws. Otherwise, those laws be, would become ultra virus, those laws would become unconstitutional, those laws would become invalid and these cannot be implemented. So, the validity was one important issue with the parliament in the process of making of legislation. And the second, the important significant issue or the problem was the rigid procedure, the formal procedure, the inflexible procedure, which takes much time in the legislative process to complete. The parliament or the legislature is to follow each and every step of that constitutional procedure in making the law, in making the enactment and it is the cause for the delay on the part of the legislature to make the laws. Also resulted into the difficulty to meet the emergent situations. If there is any emergent situation, if there is the requirement of law emergently, promptly, the legislative process cannot cope with this demand of emergent need of the law and only the executive can give the law immediately by adopting inflexible or informal procedure. One important aspect which was considered in favor of the law making powers in the hands of administration was direct participation of affected groups by way of process of consultation. It is not possible for parliament, it is not possible for the legislature to make effective consultation with the affected groups, but if the executive is given the authority to make the law by the parliament by providing for the basic framework by enacting the basic policy or the objective of the institution, objective of the legislation, then certainly the executive can make such a consultation with the affected groups, with the affected persons in making the law. One important aspect which was discussed and it was realized that the executive should also be given the law making power to some extent that was the flexibility in the amending process. The amending process of the ordinary legislation or the amendment in the legislation by ordinary legislative process, it is very difficult, it is very time taking and it is not possible to make the changes in the law in accordance with the need of the situation. Because the parliament or state legislature, the parliament in making any amendment is to or the state legislatures in making any amendment in the law is to follow the same legislative procedure which it is to follow in the enactment of the laws. And therefore, again that goes in the favor to give the legislative powers to the executive to make the law, so that the law may be changed in accordance with the need of the situation. We can refer to Henry Earth clause, which was introduced during the regime of, during the reign of Henry VIII in England, in UK. By giving the power through this Henry VIII clause, the executive or the government, the administration is given the power to make the modifications, to make the changes in the law in accordance with the circumstances, if any difficulty arises in the implementation of law. Suppose, if any law is made by the parliament, the parliament cannot foresee all those problems, all those difficulties, which would arise during the actual implementation of that law. The ground realities, all the ground realities cannot be foreseen by the legislature at the time of making the law. And if any such difficulties arise, then the executive will become helpless, it would have no option 
for making the effective implementation or enforcement of those laws. In the same situation, if the executive is to wait for the legislature to make the changes, then again and again the legislature will be called to make the changes in the law, which would take much time and that law cannot be applied, cannot be implemented, cannot be enforced within the certain or specified time period or time framework, then it will lose its significance or its objective also if that time has passed. That was also the reason for which the clauses or the powers to the executive were given in the form of Henry 8 clause, wherein the government is made empowered, is made authorized to make the changes in accordance with the circumstances, if any difficulty arises in the actual implementation of law to remove those difficulties, the government can make the changes in that law and can enforce or implement the law properly. That was also an issue for which it was realized that the rule making power should also be given to the administration, to the executive to some extent. One more important aspect for which the administrative rule making deserves priority, where government action requires exercise of discretionary powers. If any discretionary powers which is inevitable during the regime of welfare state, where there are tremendously increased functions assigned to the executive, assigned to the government. So, the discretionary powers are always there with the government and for the exercise of discretionary powers, the government or the administration always requires the rule making power in its hand. So, this is the justification for which the rule making powers are needed in the hands of administration, in the hands of executive, in, in the hands of uh, the government. These justifications became the reason for the recognition of, for the discovery of delegated legislation or the rule making powers of the administration, the rule making power of the executive, the rule making power of the government. When this procedure or this technique, this process of delegated legislation was recognized, then there were some important issues relating to the delegated legislation relating to the rule making powers of the administration. Before discussing those issues, before discussing those problems associated with the delegated legislation connected with the rule making power of the administration, we are first to understand the meaning of delegated legislation. What does it mean? The rule making powers of the administration or the delegated legislation, what is the meaning of it? What does it mean? First of all, I would like to refer the meaning given to the subordinate legislation, meaning given to the delegated legislation by the English scholar Samand. Saman defines delegated legislation as that which proceeds from any authority other than the sovereign power and is therefore dependent for its continued existence and validity on some superior or supreme authority. This is the meaning which was given by Saman to the term delegated legislation. The delegated legislation is called as subordinate legislation in England because of the fact that in England there the principle of parliamentary sovereignty prevails and all other institutions, all other organs of the state are considered to be subordinate to parliament because parliament is sovereign and therefore, any such legislation which is made by any other authority 
any authority other than the parliament is called is considered to be the subordinate legislation. Someone says that subordinate legislation is the legislation which proceeds from any authority other than the sovereign. There are two important aspects of the definition suggested by Samand to the term delegated legislation. Number one, that the delegated legislation is that legislation which proceeds, which comes out, which emanates from any authority other than the sovereign. And number two, this delegated legislation, this subordinate legislation, which comes out, which emanates, which is made by any authority other than the sovereign is dependent for its validity, it is dependent for its continuance on some superior authority that is the sovereign. So, these are the two aspects. The subordinate legislation or the delegated legislation is the legislation which proceeds from any authority other than the sovereign. When he says that the delegated legislation or subordinate legislation is the legislation which proceeds from any authority other than the sovereign, he refers to by, by, by using the word sovereign, he refers to the parliament because the parliament is sovereign in England. So, any legislation which proceeds from any authority other than the parliament, other than the legislature, it is called as the delegated legislation. One thing is clear about the meaning of delegated legislation that delegated legislation is the legislation which is not made by parliament, which is not made by the legislature. It is the legislation which is made by, which is enacted by any authority other than the parliament, any authority other than the sovereign. The second aspect, because this legislation is made by any authority other than the sovereign, therefore, it is dependent for its validity, it is dependent for its continuance on some superior authority. That superior authority is the legislature itself, that superior authority is the sovereign itself, because the legislative powers are assigned by the constitutional law to the legislature only. And in accordance with the theory of separation of powers, also in accordance with the basic spirit of rule of law, there shall not be the concentration of powers in one organ or in one institution. The powers or functions which have essentially been assigned to the legislature by the constitution should not be exercised by any other authority and therefore, only and only parliament, only and only legislature is authorized to, is empowered to make any other authority authorized to make it. That means, that the executive or administrative body or the administration makes any legislation, not by the exercise of its inherent powers, not by the exercise of its own powers, but by the exercise of, during the exercise of some powers which have been delegated to it by the parliament itself, which have been delegated to it by the legislature itself. And th th that is the reason that this delegated legislation is dependent of that delegator or the parliament or the legislature for its continuance and for its validity. When the powers are delegated, when the legislature delegates its powers to the executive for some reason and the executive or the administration is made empowered to make the law. Such a delegation on the part of the legislature, such a delegation on the part of parliament cannot be considered to be, cannot mean 
denudation meaning thereby that when delegation is made by the parliament, the parliament does not give up its authority. It only delegates to some extent, it only makes the arrangement so that, it only makes the compromise so that the executive, the administration may become capable of meeting some important, some emergent situations or some problems, so that the executive or the administration may make the law in accordance with the demand of the certain circumstances. This is not the giving up of the authority of parliament, this is not the giving up of the legislative authority of the legislature, legislature only delegates and it means that the legislature after the delegation of powers can resume these powers, can withdraw the delegation, can revoke the delegation at any stage of the process of delegated legislation. Therefore, it is said that it is dependent of some superior authority for its continuance and for its validity also when the parliament delegates its powers with some conditions by prescribing some procedure in making the delegated legislation and the executive authority or the administration does not follow, does not adopt that particular procedure or the delegate goes beyond the limits of powers which have been delegated. Then the validity of such a delegation, the delegated legislation, the validity of such a delegated legislation made by the executive, made by the administration would be in question. And this is the event of situation when the delegated legislation becomes dependent of the legislature of the superior authority for its validity. As I told you that delegation does not mean denudation, delegation does not mean giving up of certain powers, it means that the legislature or the parliament or delegating body retains the power to revoke the delegation, it also retains concurrent power to act. When the powers are delegated, it does not mean that now the legislature cannot make the law on that subject matter on which the powers have been delegated to the executive or the administration. Concurrently, the parliament always has the power. The parliament does not give up its authority to make the law on that subject matter. So, uh, even after the delegation of certain legislative powers to the executive or the administration, the parliament has the power to withdraw that delegation the parliament has the power to revoke that delegation, the parliament has the power to make the law concurrently on that subject matter. The term delegated legislation can be understood in two or from two perspectives. There are two perspectives of the meaning of the term delegated legislation. Number one, delegation of legislative power to any subordinate authority by the legislature and the exercise of this delegated power by the administrative agency. This is the first perspective from which or by which we can understand the meaning of the term delegated legislation. This first perspective of delegated legislation, this first perspective to the meaning of delegated legislation refers to the first stage of the delegated legislation and it has two components, it has two activities. Number one, the delegation of legislative powers by the parliament, by the legislature to the executive and number two, the exercise of this power by the delegate in making the delegated legislation. These are two important components or aspects or two 
activities are involved in this first perspective to the meaning of delegated legislation. Number one, the delegation of legislative power by legislature to the administrative authority. And number two, the exercise of this delegated power by the administrative authority. The second meaning or second perspective from which why which the delegated legislation may be defined or may be understood is making of delegated legislation by the subordinate authority in exercise of power delegated to it. Meaning thereby the output by product of this process of delegated legislation. So, in the first aspect of the beginning of delegated legislation, the process of delegated legislation itself is referred to, whereas in the second meaning or second aspect to the meaning of delegated legislation, the byproduct of this process, the output of this process in the form of rules, regulations, bylaws, notifications, orders, etcetera, is referred to. So, we can understand the delegated legislation from two point of views, from two perspectives. Number one are the process of delegated legislation, wherein two aspects are there. Number one, delegation of legislative power by legislature to the executive and number two, exercise of this power by the executive in making the law. The second aspect, the second perspective is the output of this process of delegated legislation in the form of delegated legislation itself, in the form of rules, in the form of regulations, in the form of notifications, etcetera. As the student of administrative law, we are concerned only to the first perspective to the meaning of delegated legislation, not to the second. We are directly involved in understanding the process of delegated legislation. We are not concerned directly to go into the details of the rules, regulations, etcetera. As the student of administrative law, we are concerned with only the first perspective of the meaning to the delegated legislation, that is the process of delegated legislation, that is two aspects of the delegated legislation. Number one, the delegation of legislative power to the executive and number two, the exercise of this delegated power by the delegate by the authority to which the powers have been delegated. The delegated legislation is denoted by several names including rules, regulations, bylaws, notifications, schemes, policies, orders, etcetera. And therefore, the delegated legislation may be classified on the basis of its title in different heads. These different heads may be rules, regulations, orders, bylaws, directions, schemes. This variety of the titles and nomenclature of the delegated legislation it may create confusion when we refer to the delegated legislation by different titles, by different names, by different nomenclatures. We are not in position to precisely define, precisely specify the nature of all these titles of delegated legislation. Sometimes we see that different titles of delegated legislation, different nomenclatures of delegated legislation are used interchangeably. Rules and regulations we cannot differentiate in very precise manner. No precise classification can be made in these titles. And therefore, the Donungmore committee recommended for the simplification of these various nomenclatures of these different titles to the delegated legislation. Friends, you must have been aware of the 
Donung Moore committee, which I referred many times in my earlier lectures. If you recall, the Donung Moore committee was constituted in 1930 in UK in England after the publication of the book by Lord Hayward under the title The New Despotism. And this Dunungmer committee was given the task to inquire into the area of administrative rule making into the area of delegated legislation. Because Lord Hewitt in his book which he published in 1929 showed his concerns about the preservation of the rule of law, the preservation of the doctrine, the philosophy of rule of law and the preservation of parliamentary sovereignty. He was of the opinion that more and more powers on the ministers, the delegation of legislative powers by the parliament to the ministers to the administrative authorities, it posed the challenge for the preservation of rule of law, for the preservation of parliamentary sovereignty principle. He was of the opinion that this delegation of legislative powers or this new administrative process in the name of delegated legislation, this new administrative process in the name of rule making powers of the administration, this new administrative process in the form of the delegation of legislative powers to the ministers creates the threat to the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty principle. He said that if the parliament is allowed without any restriction, without any restraint, without any basic policy to continue the delegation of legislative powers to the ministers, then certainly there would be dilution of parliamentary sovereignty principle if parliament effaces itself, if the parliament abdicates from all its functions assigned to it by the constitution. And parliamentary sovereignty principle is a fundamental constitutional principle of English legal system. He says that that would be the threat for the parliamentary sovereignty principle and rule of law both reason being that no restrictions could be imposed, no restraints could be imposed over the authority of parliament being the parliament sovereign. In this background, the Donung Moore committee was constituted in England to investigate into the area of delegated legislation, particularly on the question whether the process of delegated legislation, whether this new administrative process, whether the delegation of legislative powers to the ministers, to the administrative authorities is the threat for the rule of law, parliamentary sovereignty and the basic freedoms and liberties of individuals. Donungmore committee investigated into the issue and recommended that concluded that, that this, this new administrative process has become the need of the hour due to the increased functions of the government and it cannot be the threat to the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty principles if effective safeguards are discovered. And these safeguards were discovered on the recommendation of Donungur committee by the British parliament by enacting the statutory instrument act 1946. So, that Donungur committee also suggested in its report for the simplification of the nomenclatures or titles of the bewildering variety of the titles of delegated legislation. The Donungmore committee suggested that the term rule be confined to denote the delegated legislation 
regulating the procedure. It was the suggestion of Donogbur committee that the term rule be confined to denote the delegated legislation regulating the procedures. Number two, the term regulation be used to imply substantive delegated legislation for procedural delegated legislation for the delegated legislation representing procedure the rule should be used and for the delegated legislation representing the substantive part the regulation should be used that was the suggestion of Donogmore committee. The Donogmore committee also suggested that the term order be restricted to signify delegated legislation made in exercise of powers of administrative decision making. So, the rule should be confined for the procedural aspect of delegated legislation, the regulation should be confined to the substantive delegated legislation and the order should be restricted to signify delegated legislation made in the exercise of the administrative decision making. The delegated legislation can also be classified on the basis of the extent of discretion given to the authority. So, the classification based on the discretion is of two kinds. The delegated legislation can be classified into two types number one delegated legislation and number two conditional or contingent legislation the delegated legislation then number two conditional legislation or contingent legislation. Friends it is very important for us to understand the point of distinction in these two types of delegated legislation based on the discretion delegated to the authority. As in further lectures relating to the constitutionality of delegated legislation, the distinction in delegated legislation and contingent legislation would matter. Field versus Clark, this case was decided by US Supreme Court in 1892, wherein the US Supreme Court observed held that Congress cannot delegate its legislative powers what it can delegate the power to determine some factors, conditions or state of things upon which it intends to depend the enforcement of law enacted by legislature. By this observation of the US Supreme Court in the case of Field versus Clark, we can understand the meaning of conditional legislation. As we know that in US, the separation of powers is the basic constitutional principle is the fundamental constitutional principle and whole structure of American constitution is grounded on the doctrine of separation of powers. And therefore, the Supreme Court of US says that the legislature cannot delegate its legislative powers, but it can delegate the power to determine some factors, conditions or a state of things in which the administration or the executive is to enforce the law or is to apply the law. In the case of Emperor versus Vanwari Lal decided by Privy Council, the doctrine of conditional legislation was invoked. In this case, the governor general promulgated an ordinance for the establishment of special courts and delegated the power to extend the duration of ordinance on the provincial government. There may be the classification of the delegated legislation on the basis of title of the delegated legislation as enabling act, extension and application act, dispensing and suspending act alteration act, taxing act, supplementary act, approving and sanctioning act, classifying and fixing standards act, sub delegation section 5 of essential commodities act provides for the sub delegation, but the sub delegation is not 
permitted because of the doctrine of delegatus non potes delegat unless it is approved by or it is sanctioned by the enabling act the parent act. The Donogmore committee classified the delegated legislation or delegation of legislative power into two ordinary delegation and exceptional delegation. Ordinary delegation has two aspects positive where limits of delegation are clearly specified in the act and negative where delegated power excludes the power to certain things. Exceptional delegation where the delegated power includes the power to legislate on policy matters in the form of skeletal legislation, power to amend the law made by competent legislature, power to make delegated legislation without judicial review and delegation of broad discretion like Henry 8 clause. So, these are the different kinds or types of delegated legislation. We discussed in this lecture the, the meaning of delegated legislation, the types of delegated legislation and the justifications or need for the delegated legislation. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone wiet and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, it was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening, I have an appointment with him in Samara. <laughs>
See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.